Stay with us till night has come. Our praise to you this day be sung. Bless our bread, open our eyes. Jesus, we are great surprise. Talk with us till we behold a joyful life you will unfold. Heal our eyes to see the prize. Jesus, take us to the light. Stay with us till day is done. No tears nor dark shall dim the sun. Cheer the heart, your grace impart. Jesus, bring Our first lesson comes from the book of Acts, the third chapter beginning at the twelfth verse. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of First John, the third chapter beginning at the first verse. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will all be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning in the 36th verse. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of our Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Greetings, sisters and brothers in Christ. The title of our message for this third week of, Lent, of Easter, third week of Easter is Resurrection means your transformation. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this week I read a story, and it was a story about astronauts who uh, landed on the moon and they were very excited. They were looking at the earth from the moon as we've all seen those beautiful photographs of the earth from the vantage of the moon. And then they got this terrible message from back home and it was that there had been this gross error and that um, they only had enough oxygen um, to last just a little longer. They would not be able to return home to Earth. And so um, the astronauts stood there looking back at their beloved Earth, our beloved Earth, and I invite you for a minute to put yourself in the story and imagine you're standing on the moon. You know you have very little time left. You're looking back at our beloved Earth. And other than your loved ones, the people you love, what is it you would most miss from this Earth? as you stood looking from afar, from the moon at the earth, what is it you would most miss? I thought of um, riding my bicycle um, in Newport on Ocean Drive. I've done it thousands of times and it never gets old. I thought of walking my dogs around the reservoir in Newport late afternoon, that golden time of day with the sunlight on my face. And I thought of standing beside a beech tree, always my favorite trees, and touching the skin of the beech tree and feeling that deep communion, that deep connection I have with all trees, but especially with beech trees. So what is it that you would deeply miss as you gaze upon the earth? Well, um, I also read this week that the real miracle is not to walk on water. The real miracle is for us to walk upon this earth um, and be fully alive, realize how how deeply connected we are with our beloved earth and to appreciate every moment of it. Now imagine you're on the moon and you get another um, message from earth and they say, our scientists have been at work and there's a way we can override this problem so you'll be able to come home after all. You'll be able to return to earth. It's kind of like Ebenezer Scrooge waking up on Christmas morning and saying, ah, oh, it was all a dream. I'm given a new start, a new beginning. Would you, when you return to earth, appreciate it more deeply? Would you walk upon this earth more connected with all that is, more fully alive and more deeply appreciative? That is what it would mean for us to walk as people of the resurrection. This Thursday, April 22nd, is Earth Day. And uh, Earth Day always comes on April 22nd. So it always comes in the middle of spring 
When the entire earth is resurrecting, we have so much to learn from our earth and the, the changing of the seasons, right? We wouldn't have spring if we didn't also have summer, fall, and winter. We wouldn't have resurrection of the earth if we did not have death of those seeds planted beneath the earth in winter. In Romans chapter 6, St. Paul writes about our lives and the resurrection. And he says, do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death so that as Christ rose from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. Sisters and brothers, Jesus' resurrection means that our lives also are resurrected. And not just when we die, but right now, this moment, today. What does the resurrection mean in your life? Well, I find it very interesting um, in all the gospel stories about Jesus appearing to his disciples, as we saw last week and as we saw today. Um, at first, his closest friends, his beloved ones, his closest companions do not recognize him in his resurrected form. And then he says something or he does something, and they do. They see him. There's one thing we know that we can count on in this life, and that is that everything, everything is constantly changing, right? For Lent, we used a book written by a scientist, Bishop Nicholas Nisley, called Lent is Not Rocket Science. And he talks about how in nature, everything is constantly transforming. Our bodies, he says, every day cells in our bodies die and new cells come into being. In fact, every seven years, all the cells in our bodies are completely different. They've, over a seven year period, they've all completely changed. So we're literally, literally new, made new. Um, I think of my grandchildren who I haven't been able to see as much during this time of the pandemic. And when I get videos or photos of them or FaceTime with them, they look so very different. They look um, so much older and so much more grown up. And yet, of course, we see the connection. We see the connection. And there's a little bit of a grieving for what was, which will not be anymore. That little kid who before the pandemic was little and now has grown a year and a half later. Um, St. Paul compares these changes to those which take place between a seed and a plant. In 1 Corinthians 15, St. Paul talks about our bodily resurrection as what is planted in the earth is a seed and what comes forth from that dead-looking thing is a plant, a glorious plant. And he said the 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 death part, the seed, um, and what grows forth from it are certainly connected, they're related, but the resurrected form is so much more glorious. So much more glorious. And so um, I think that's what was going on with Jesus in his resurrected form. It was his true nature, his eternal self. Remember, even on the Mount of Transfiguration, they had a little glimpse of that. He appeared before them in brilliant, radiant, dazzling light. And I think that the resurrected Christ was just filled with that light, emanating that light. 
but we suffer because sometimes we cling too tightly to the physical form, the external form. For we know that we too are like Christ. We are eternal. We have our eternal nature, our Christ-like nature, that imago Dei, that spark of God within us, which is eternal. And then we have this, our external form. And we forget, we, we become too attached to the external form. So when children grow, there's a little part of us that grieves the little baby who's not there anymore. But if we look closely, we see that that child is the same. The true nature of that child, that essence of that child, that eternal nature is there. And for us to live as Easter people, as, as people of the resurrection, would be to, for us to let Christ and that eternal nature, that kingdom of God, grow more and more and more in us so that others might not even recognize us at first. They might say, hmm, there's something different about you. And that's because they see that eternal nature in us. Now, resurrection, as we said, does not happen unless there's first a dying. So what is it we need to die to? Well, in our first reading from Acts, St. Peter challenges the people um, who were responsible for the death of Christ. And he says, you killed the author of life. But then he says to them, however, it was because of your ignorance, which literally means not knowing you, as Jesus said from the cross, they know not what they do. It was ignorance, um, not knowing. And Peter says, therefore, repent, turn, so that your sins may be wiped out. I love our second reading from 1 John, which speaks about sin also as kind of ignorance or not knowing. Um, if we knew we would live our lives differently, we'd live it like those astronauts when they return to Earth fully alive, appreciating every moment we walk upon this precious earth. But so often we just live in our surface nature, our not true eternal self. So in 1 John 3, starting with verse 4, it says, Everyone who sins is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that Christ was revealed to take away sin. In Christ, there is no sin. No one who abides in Christ sins. No one who abides in Christ sins. Now, that's again, if we really know Christ, we're not ignorant. So if Christ is fully in us, and that Christ's nature has become us fully. We are truly living in our eternal nature, our Christ-like nature. Then how could we sin, right? Or I think of sin as it's often defined as separation, right? Uh, sin as whatever separates us from God, from others, and from living that fullness of life God desires for us. But the great mystics know that separation does not really exist. My favorite saint, Juliana of Norwich, said, between you and God, there is no between. So sisters and brothers, um, a final story I read this week was of a father whose young son had died and a monk friend of his took him for a walk. And the monk held his hand and said, let us walk around this beautiful retreat center, around these beautiful grounds, and let us see your son in other forms, the monk said to the father. And they got to a certain place in their walk, 
and there was this glorious plum tree in full bloom that the monk, who also loved this little boy, had planted in honor of this little boy's life. And the monk told this to the father, and the father looked at this tree in full bloom and said, I can see my son waving at us from every branch and blossom. Sisters and brothers, the resurrection of Jesus means that we too live our lives in a new way. Can we have those eyes, those eyes that see the Christ, the resurrected Christ in all things, and also reflect the resurrected Christ to all things? Can we look in, in all we encounter for that eternal nature, the true nature of you, of me, of Christ, of this precious earth, of all that is. Amen.
And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May God look upon us with blessing and grant us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve God and the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.